So, welcome everybody. I hope you can hear and see me. This is the second lecture in my course, the Arahants and the Arahant and the Four Truth in Early Buddhist Discourse in 2012. So I'm first going to look at the blog. Yeah, and that was uh, very encouraging for me to see how many and how interesting uh, the contributions on the blog. This is this is very beautiful. So I wanted to express my appreciation. I am not able to take up all and everything, uh, but I am just giving a short selection of what uh, things that I would like to reply to or things that I I felt so nice that I would like to just repeat what uh, other contributors have said also for the sake of those who later on will only hear the audio and not be able to go and see the things themselves on the blog. The first uh, question came from Linda Grace. She was asking, maybe I'll paste the questions in here, then those of you can read. Was the general idea of three or any other number of stages prior to Arahanship found in any form in other systems or sects at the time of the Buddha? To my knowledge, the term Arahant was used by other traditions. We get that in texts of the giant traditions. But these gradual stages leading up to Arahantship, uh, I am not aware of these being found in another tradition outside of Buddhism. Then another question again by Linda Grace. The Buddha did not seem to speak of his own awakening in terms of the four stages, other than final Arahantship, of course. In terms of the account of his awakening, the night under the Bodhi tree, presumably if he did go through something like the three previous stages, it would have happened in a relatively short span of time. Yeah, that seems to be indeed the case. And the Buddha is not the only one. We get uh, different accounts. There is a layman called Yasa. I think Bhikkhu Bodhi briefly mentioned him. And he became an Arahant very quickly. He just became Sri Mantra and then right away Arahant. There is a non-Buddhist ascetic called Bahia. And he managed to become Arahant apparently right at the time when he met the Buddha for the first time. So he did everything in one go. And of Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana, the two chief disciples of the Buddha, we also have the report that they attained stream entry. And then relatively soon afterwards, one or two weeks, they became Arahans. So apparently the need to have, a, how shall we call it, a time gap between each of the four stages does not apply. And uh, the discourses explain to us that the degree to which somebody is able to progress depends on their respective faculties, the indriyas. Uh, five indriyas. And these are uh, faith or confidence, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. So the question is, how far has somebody been developing this in some way or another previous to the particular culmination point in his or her practice, in his or her understanding, so that the experience of nirvana will lead to uh, eradication of all fetters or maybe just some fetters? And... Uh, she also asked another question, and then I'll come. <clears throat> she says, in terms of the suttas, are there any major differences between the Agamas and the Pali discourse in respect to the four stages? No. There are no essential differences. As far as we are able to tell from the scriptures and from comparative studies, 
these four levels of awakening represent early Buddhist teachings. Then there's uh, another question, and this is from Venerable Xin Shen Shi, and she asks, <clears throat> why are there only two destinations available for the lay person after attaining arahanship? Yeah, the, the, the point according to early Buddhism is that a lay person can become an arahant. This is possible. But the becoming of an arahant will so much transform him or her that after that they are no longer able to live a normal lay life. Either they will go forth and lead a life without any kind of possessions and a life of celibacy, an arahant is unable to engage in sexual intercourse. And if they do not go forth, then this is usually because for some bizarre karmic reason they have been passing away right away after they became arahants. So these uh, two destinations uh, sounds a little strange, but the basic point is actually there's only one destination if we put it simply. The destination of one who is an arahant is to live a life of celibacy and possessionlessness. And only if they happen to die just after they had become an arahant, then they, they haven't had time to become a monk or to become a nun. And then there's another question she asks. <clears throat> the Diga Nikaya also shows that the future Buddha Metteya will be reborn in the human world so as to attain Buddhahood. When non-returners are reborn in higher realms and they realize final Nibbana, can they attain Buddhahood there? Yeah, um, first I am um, very sorry, but um, the story of Maitreya Buddha, as far as we are able to tell, does not appear to belong to the earliest strata of uh, the Buddhist teachings. I have done a comparative study of the relevant Discourses, the Discourse on the Wheel-Turning King, and this has been published in a book uh, which is called The Genesis of the Bodhisattva Ideal. I have put a link uh, for all of you up on the web page, so anybody who likes to get into this topic is very welcome to download the PDF of the whole book. And it seems fairly clear that the only occurrence of the Buddha Maitreya in the Pali discourses in the Diga Nikaya is a later addition to that discourse. And uh, regarding the question whether a non-returner can attain Buddhahood there, uh, the question is a little difficult to answer from the perspective of what I am operating from, what is the topic of this discourse, namely the early discourses the topic of this course, I'm sorry, because the whole idea that somebody may want to become a Buddha is a later development. This is not found in early Buddhism. The only passages we get is in one of the Chinese Agamas, the Ekotarika Agama, and this has some very late passages. It does not represent early Buddhism. So this whole idea of what one needs to do to become a Buddha is something that only later texts that fall out of the scope of what we are doing here will be able to tell us. What the early Buddhist discourses indicate is that somebody who has entered on stream entry, who has attained stream entry, such a person, he or she is bound to become an arahant. So... A uh, non-returner would be bound to become an arahant, and from an early Buddhist perspective, he or she would, or it's being reborn as a Brahma it or whatever, would first of all not have the idea to become a Buddha, and secondly also not stand a chance to become a Buddha anymore. Buddhas only arise during the times when there is no dispensation of the Buddha still around stream entry, etc., up to Aranship, are stages one attains when the dispensation of a Buddha is still there. Yeah, there are so many rich topics, so maybe I briefly see if there are any uh, questions on this topic of Arahant and Buddhahood, I believe. Yeah, we come back to the Arahant a little later. 
but there are so many other things. Marta Turner, what implications can be drawn from the two destinations of an Arahant? For example, that one then only become an Arahant in the immediate vicinity of the Sangha, specifically of a group that would receive them, it would seem to have implications for the process of becoming an Arahant. Yeah, Marta, that's a very interesting thought. I, I, I think we should not take this too literal, but try to get the, the very central meaning behind that. So, uh, if uh, you should become an Arahant right now, uh, hopefully doing this course and listening to me, that would be wonderful. Then you don't have to like, 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 uh, get into the next cab and rush off to find some monastery close by to get ordained. I mean, just as soon as you have become an Arahant, you would want to live a life of celibacy and want to drop your, your, your possessions. And whenever and however this is reasonably possible, you would go forth in some way or another. If you live in some part of the world where there is no Buddhist Sangha, you would in, in, in some way find a way around. But it is not that your actual ability to attain Aranship depends on some uh, close-by condition that would then allow you immediately to go forth as a bhikkhuni. Andrew Lai, when one attains stream entry and then is reborn as a human again, will he or she lie and kill a childhood? Well, lies and falsehood is uh, something there are different grades of, but to undertake killing, let's say a heavy kind of killing that involves a mammal or even a human being, I think that's definitely impossible. And also a falsehood of the type that would really harm others. But there are these, uh, falsehood is a very broad topic. We got into that a little bit last year. And there are different levels of falsehood. So there's also the kind of innocent falsehood, the, the silly joke or so. And killing also, there is the half accidental, half willed killing of a mosquito, say. And so these things I am not entirely sure. But uh, a stream enter would definitely not be able to do uh, a really unwholesome act. Rodolfo Rivas Molina. So a once returner who is reborn in a celestial realm is bound to become an Arahant. Will do so in that realm. Am I understanding it correctly? Yeah, if we if we speak about the non-returner, I think that is the that is the point. I think that is just a typing error. So a non-returner by definition will be reborn in a particular celestial realm and in that realm he is going to become an Arahant. Yeah. A, a once returner on the contrary comes once back to this world which could be even the human world and will continue his or her practice there. Right. Then I continue with the blog. This is from Angus Cargill. I hope I pronounced the name properly. Is it possible to be passionate about something that is very wrong and use the passion and even anger this generates for a good purpose? <laughs> I'm very sorry, but uh, from an early Buddhist viewpoint, this is not possible. Passion and anger are unwholesome by definition, and they will disable us from doing anything that leads to a good purpose. He has another question. Is mental tranquility always good if it means, for example, not confronting injustice? My reply, mental tranquility is always good, especially when we need to confront injustice. My point is that mental tranquility does not mean that we avoid things, it means that we remain calm when we need to confront things. And another question by him, still Angus Cargill. Might a person who has their passion roused and as a result prevents evil from taking place be better than someone who remains tranquil and inactive when they see evil happening? 
Again, you might already anticipate my reply, this doesn't work. A person who has their passions aroused, as a result of that very arousing of passion, has aroused the tendency for evil within themselves. And to remain tranquil does not mean to remain inactive. It means to remain tranquil within when we have to sometimes take action. Then there's a question by Wei Yin Cho. She asks, uh, surely an Arahant would find it easy to enter and abide jhanas. And in another blog comment she also says, would jhanas be also easily within reach for stream winners? And I think in general we can certainly see such a relationship. The ability to attain mental tranquility, which would mean absorption, but even levels of concentration that are close to absorption, uh, definitely requires a firm basis in morality. So for an arahant, morality has become effortless. He or she is just by nature such that they will not progress, transgress, I'm sorry, against morality. So their basis is very, very firm. And this naturally leads to a tranquil mind. A stream enterer has not yet eradicated a sensual desire, so the situation is somewhat different. But however much we progress on the path of morality and the eradication of defilements, so much easier it will become to experience tranquility of the mind. Yeah, then we are back to the fetters, and Adam Clark, uh, very kind of him, he uh, reminded me of mentioning that in the commentary text, the internal fetters that were discussed in the discourse, they are associated with the five lower fetters, that is, those below the non-returner, and the external fetters with the five higher ones. And this is what the commentary on the particular discourse we have been discussing, Anguttara Nikaya, 2.4.5 has been been saying and yes Stuart Corner uh, uh, also was asking about the translation in the by hair if the person fettered as to the self and I, I'm sorry I forgot to mention that last time I had it on my lecture notes but somehow I overlooked that yeah hair's translation is misleading the Pali term is ajhata internal so the self, the Atta, has, has nothing to do with this discourse. Yeah, now we come to, to the question of Viraga. This is Michael Beisert. Beisert. In many suttas, he says, Viraga, dispassion, is given as a condition for insight. On the other hand, Pamoja, uh, he translates as content, I would translate it as joy, is given as a condition for samadhi. He says, I don't know of any sutta except for the Madhyama Agama 21, which we have been discussing, which states viraga as a condition for samadhi. If that would be right, the whole insight enlightenment sequence wouldn't make any sense. And in another blog entry, he makes the same point again, he says Samadhi is a condition for Viraga and not the other way around as stated in Madhyama Agama 21. And I think that uh, while his basic point is certainly correct, I think we need to see these two factors, Samadhi and Viraga, concentration and dispassion, as two factors that help each other, that work in conjunction. There's a very basic level of dispassion that is actually a precondition for concentration. And the concentration gained in this way will then lead on to more dispassion. And that more dispassion will again lead on to more concentration. And also I think um, viraga and dispassion is not opposed to joy, pamonja. On the contrary, actually, joy comes from having had some degree of dispassion. It's very interesting, but you can see it in the practice. The more the more we let go of running after things outside, 
the more easier it becomes for the source of joy inside to unfold. And um, we get uh, the sense of viraga as a precondition for concentration if we turn to the standard formulation of the first absorption. The very first condition for getting the first jhana is said to be vivicceva kamehi, seclusion from sensual desires or from sensual pleasures. And this is none other than a very basic level of viraga. And it's precisely because of that inner distance from sensuality, from involvement with the world of sensual pleasures, that uh, somebody will be able to attain absorption and thereby experience real happiness and joy of a much stronger, intenser, and purer form than is possible through any of the senses. And I just want to reread the passage in Madhyama Agama for you. We have been discussing here. So it says, He further trains in disenchantment regarding sensual desires, in dispassion, and in abandoning sensual desires. And this is clearly a precondition for attaining absorption. And I think it's a meaningful precondition and it fits with uh, what other discourses have to say on this matter. Yeah. Not sure if there's any uh, questions on this issue of Viraga. Then I continue with the contribution by Rosa Grau. Yeah, this whole issue about this image with the Deva standing on all and all that. And so Rosa Grau gives us that very nice summary. She says, the important point the Buddha makes when he corrects Sariputta's exposition is that mental development must be undertaken in this world and not be postponed for another life. And I think that's right on the spot. Thank you. That's what I always try to tell all my friends. <laughs> and there's another comment by her. Uh, she says, as to the meaning of the metaphor of standing on the tip of an awl, a possible reading is that the one who cultivates the mind cannot be measured by the usual parameters of space and time, we should think. They are immeasurable and free. Yeah, that is a very nice interpretation. And Mark uh, Johnson has also made a nice uh, comment on the awl simile. He says, the metaphor also seems to emphasize non-conflict and lack of boundary among these devas. Yeah. And then there's uh, Bhikkhuni Suvimali has also been uh, contributing uh, to that. And she says, it occurred to me that we are all, when following your e-learning course, standing, so to speak, on an all a beam, without jostling and crowding each other, and all created by computer technology. Just like technology providing us with images and the like, if the mind is highly trained to attain one-pointed concentration, it could penetrate the mind-body and view the rising and passing of psychological and physical phenomena. Also very nice. So I want to Thank all three of you, because I have to admit that I was not so happy with this uh, metaphor. I didn't really know what to do with it, but now I have, uh, I'm, I'm getting some, some way of, of uh, making sense out of it. That's the benefit of doing these courses, that I learn so much. Yeah, I don't know, Rodolfo, if you have something on this, then please put your question. Ah, there it is. Uh, Rodolfo Rivas Molina, he says, not postponed for another life coincides with the fact that the vow to become a Buddha in a future life is not found. I don't get the rest. Yeah, but that, that's, that's precisely the point. Yeah, that is one of the, the things that, that we get much more with later tradition that, uh, somehow this, this, this feeling that I can't do it anyway this life, so let me just prepare so that at some point in the future I can do what I want to do, be this uh, development of liberating insight or even becoming a Buddha. Whereas with the early discourses we get this, 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 this very strong flavor of, yes, you can, you can do it now. 
And however much you can, do it now because that much you are safe, you have progressed that far. And that is, that is, uh, I think, a very important flavor from this, this Diteva Dhamme now, here and now. A very important flavor that we get when we read the, the early, early discourses. Yeah, thank you, Rodolfo. So I continue with Michael Haggerty. And he asks, must I believe that many disciples had psychic powers, the divine ear, reading the minds of others in order to be a Buddhist in good standing? And I just uh, like to repeat what Mark Johnson said, a very nice reply. The beliefs about devas and supernormal powers seem rather insignificant if we can truly make progress in living a life relatively free of anger, irritation, greed, getting free of the whole ego-centered mess. Even belief in something as seemingly fundamental to the teachings of the Buddha as rebirth is allowed to go on the back burner for many people. No problem. They are not the central issues and not what keeps me going with meditation and exploration of such useful and practical teachings as dependent origination. The beautiful thing is that no one is checking your membership card and nobody tries to ask you to leave. Yes, I'm not going to ask anybody to leave if you just don't believe in certain things. Ah, we are coming back to this passion again. Yeah, I've gone a little bit according to when the comments were made. <coughs> this is Laura de Bernardi. She says, This passion to me suggests such a grey, dull world. Whereas I want to live in a happy, bright vibrancy. Do I understand this passion correctly when I think of it as non-attachment to and non-dependence on sensual pleasures? Does this mean, however, that I can still experience the exquisite beauty of color, for instance? Yes, very good that Laura has the courage to formulate these things because it's very important for us to think these things through and come to a proper understanding. So I am here again with Mark Johnson. He says, The wish for vibrancy and aliveness will be the very thing that will set us up for disappointment resulting in a lifeless gray world. Once the desire and the wish can be let go of, and life entered upon with no expectation, just to encounter it fully as it is in each moment, then the magic begins to happen. And another reply by Derek Sola, he quotes several suttas, and then he says, The suttas mentioned above reveal that dispassion is a very important, essential part of the holy life. Dispassion is to be developed and cultivated for the sake of Nibbana. Indeed. And Rosa Grau again. She says, To me, disenchantment means realizing by experience that nothing in the outer world will make you permanently happy and letting go of desire for outer satisfaction. To me, viraga is the process by which those external things lose their power of attraction, not by rejection, but just because one knows the drawbacks and is not interested anymore. That is freedom, because you are in control. I think that's a very important point. This passion means indeed freedom. It means freedom from the shackles of sensual lust. And I would like to mention that Arahans are still able to appreciate beauty of nature. If we look at Terigata and Teragata, the poems spoken by Arahan disciples, we find several poems where they praise the beauty of nature. Even Mahakasyapa, Kasapa, Mahakasapa, a monk known for being very austere and an observer of the ascetic practices. And he has this, this poems where he describes the beauty of the mountain on which he's meditating. The flowers are blooming, etc. So, this passion does not mean everything becomes dull and gray. And it does not mean we can no longer appreciate the beauty in nature. Arahans are actually the most happy type of peoples you can find, I think, in early Buddhism. With later times, the Arahant ideal seems to have changed a little bit and become somewhat more austere and forbidding 
And this is particularly a topic that we will be taking up during the course. The first discourses we will look at show us one of these very uh, vibrant Arahant Sariputta, and later on we will come to another discourse that gives us a somewhat different picture. But as long as we speak of early Buddhism, to become dispassionate one is the very contrary to living in a gray and dull world. And Laura had also brought up the topic of non-duality, but Juliana Martini has already clarified that non-duality is not the final goal in early Buddhism. And as I have also written on that in my Satipatthana book, I don't want to go into that any further. Then there is a question by Darshana Makavita. He asks if Majjhima Nikaya 21 contains both the discourse by Sariputta and the appearance of the Devas. Yeah. They feel almost like separate discourses, but they are definitely the same. It's just a single discourse. And then he asks, does Madhyama Agama 21 actually tell that a person has to complete the morality, dispassion, concentration in sequence? Or just that after developing morality to become a non-returner, we have to further achieve both dispassion and right concentration? Uh, the passage itself says, having observed the training in the precepts, and then he further trains in disenchantment regarding sensual desires. So the precepts are really the basis. And then, through having trained in disenchantment regarding sensual desires, in dispassion and in abandoning sensual desires, he attains a peaceful liberation of the mind. So we clearly, what we have here is a gradual progress in which each builds on the other. But then again, as we had the topic before about viraga and concentration, the things interrelate. There's a very beautiful simile in the Sunadanda Sutta of the Diga Nikaya. I just give you the reference for anybody who likes to follow this up. Uh, the references I usually give are to the Pali text of the PTS edition. So this is Diga Nikaya, volume 1, page 124. And in the translations, you sometimes find these either in square brackets or on top of the page mentioned where they are roughly are in the Pali text. So this simile says, morality and wisdom are like two hands washing each other. It's a very beautiful simile. It says that like one hand washes the other. None of them can do with just one. You can't you can't wash with one hand, no. So morality is the foundation. There's no question about that. But wisdom is not just something that we build on the foundation, but the very development of wisdom in turn strengthens the foundation. They interrelate. I want to see briefly if there are questions about what we have been looking at so far. Then I go with the next. That's Rodolfo Rivas Molina. I have a question regarding stream enters, he says. They can be reborn in either human or deva realm, where they finally get enlightenment, or I prefer awakening. That means that in other realms you can practice Buddhism and there are Dharma teachings. Am I correct? Yeah, the notion that only human beings can progress uh, to awakening is a later development in some Buddhist traditions. The early suttas clearly tell us that, uh, for example, Saka, uh, the king of the gods in the heaven of the 33, that he became a stream enterer when he went to hear a discourse from the Buddha. And he has another question on the stream enterer. If there is no possibility to go backwards in the practice, is he reborn remembering his attainments when he became a stream enterer? Yeah, this, this question is not directly tackled in the early discourses. 
According to tradition, the way I understand this, the idea is that the experience of nirvana uh, at stream entry is the most profound and extraordinary type of experience anybody could have. And so this is such an impact that at the time of death, when the most, the strongest uh, uh, impacts, experiences you had in your life are kind of, in a, in a kind of summary of your whole life come, this, this will inevitably come up. This, and this will, the, the, the very memory of this totally different sphere will have, uh, will, will make sure that it is impossible for the mind from that memory on to go to be reborn in a lower realm. And I presume the same would then continue to be happening uh, in when a stream enterer who has been reborn but has not been strengthening his or her practice then passes away again. But as I said, from the perspective of the early discourses, I am not aware of this being discussed. Yeah, that's on the stream enterer. Again, I invite question before I get go for arahanship and Buddhahood. That would be the last topic from the very, very interesting discussion on the blog. No question, then I I simply continue. Hmm. That is Rosa Grau again. Yeah. She asked, what is the difference between arahanship and Buddhahood? Again, here I am speaking from the perspective of the early discourses. The main difference is that uh, somebody attains arahanship because he or she follows the teachings of the Buddha. There's a Buddha who explains how to walk the path to liberation, and the arahant has become an arahant by following these teachings. On the contrary, a Buddha does not get any teachings from anybody. Somebody who is about to become a Buddha is born at a time when the previous Buddha and the teachings of this previous Buddha have disappeared. So, evidently, to find one's way alone without any kind of guidance is a rather difficult feat. We have the story of how the Buddha had to experiment. He first tried out uh, to develop concentration up to the immaterial realms and found that that was not quite what he was looking for. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he undertook ascetic practices and again found this is not the thing leading me to what I want to get. So it takes a lot of uh, searching and also a lot of uh, very ripe, mature spiritual qualities to be able to find one's way alone. And then when uh, he had become a Buddha, uh, this manifested in him being particularly uh, powerful. So he, had, for example, there are ten abilities called the ten powers of a Tathagata. Tathagata is uh, another term for uh, mostly used for the Buddha, at times also for an Arahant, but here it stands for the Buddha. So there are ten specific abilities of the Buddha, and the disciples may have some of these. Apparently Anuruddha had quite some of these, but according to tradition, uh, none of them has it just the way the Buddha has these ten powers. But this does not affect the basic question of the eradication of defilements. Here, Arahants and Buddhas have reached the same. The idea that Arahants have not completely eradicated the defilements or only eradicated some and Bodhisattvas who progress to Buddhahood eradicate all, this is a very much later development without any base in the early discourses. Then uh, again by Rosa Grau, <coughs> excuse me. In the Mahayana tradition, Buddhahood is considered to be superior to Arahanship. Could we say so based on the Pali Suttas? And when did the distinction appear? Yeah, the notion of following the path to Buddhahood is a later development. And I have tried to trace 
how this has begun in my book that I mentioned before, which you can download from the from the OLAD website, the Genesis of the Bodhisattva Ideal. So in uh, the early Buddhism, we do not get this distinction of what later then is called the three vehicles, the vehicle of the Shravaka, the hearer or disciple who progresses to Arahanship, the vehicle of the one who processes to become a solitary Buddha, a Pratyeka Buddha or Pacheka Buddha, and the supposedly superior vehicle of the Bodhisattva who progresses to Buddhahood. But as an individual, the Buddha was definitely considered superior to his Arahant disciples. This is clearly already there in early Buddhism. And this is quite obvious because, as I just said, he discovered the path and the others were just following his discovery. So gratitude and recognition for this feat of finding the path to liberation made him clearly superior. He was considered foremost in the early Buddhist community. But the idea that this should be followed, that one should be reborn in a place where there's no Buddhism in order to progress on the path to Buddhahood, this is foreign to early Buddhism. And then last I come to Venable Xianxian Chi again. This is a remark that has just appeared a few minutes before I came over here, but I still caught it. It's still on the question of why in the Mahayana tradition Buddhahood is uh, considered superior to Arahantship. And she explains that this is because when one becomes an Arahant and enters Nibbana without remainder, one cannot benefit sentient beings anymore. But when one attains Buddhahood, according to the Mahayana tradition, one does not abide in Nibbana without remainder, and thus he, she can continue to benefit infinite sentient beings. Yeah, that is the Mahayana perspective, and it's always good that we are reminded of that. It's just that from an early Buddhist perspective, I just like to add that from an early Buddhist perspective, this does not work. A bodhisattva, one on the path to Buddhahood, has not yet eradicated defilements and thus is not really able to benefit beings the way an arahant can. And as we are going to see in this course, in early Buddhism, arahants very clearly do benefit and help others. That is a very, very clear characteristic. It is only in later tradition that the Arahant is depicted as being selfish and not wanting to help others. This is not the case for early Buddhism. So when we compare the Bodhisattva and the Arahant, the Arahant is definitely uh, better able to help others than the Bodhisattva. And the idea that the Buddha does not pass away to Nibbana without remainder is also not there in early Buddhism. The Buddha, what happens when the Buddha dies, what happens when an Arahant dies is just the same. So whether you become a Buddha or whether you become an Arahant, the rest of your life after that you, you're gone. There's no way for you to be helping others anymore. But, and I think this is, and I'm, I'm very grateful for Xin Chen Shi to bring up this Mahayana perspective because it has informed much of the assessment of the Arahant ideal. And this is one, one central point, in fact, that I wish to make in this course is for us to really understand the implications of the Arahant ideal for which Bhikkhu Bodhi has so beautifully laid out the groundwork. And I am particularly concerned with that aspect that the Arahant really is there for others. He, he or she is willing to help, is full of compassion and all that. This is very important, I think. And we will, we, we are seeing this uh, in the discourses that we are now going to study. So, this is a very beautiful discussion from the blog. And yeah, I, 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 I clear this out. And there is a room for you now to put any question regarding the topics that I've been reviewing from the blog. And if not, then we are actually perfect in time, half 
of our time is over. That's exactly what I was hoping to do. And then we can go for Manyama Agama 22. Oh, <laughs> the nada. Good, then we go for Madhyama Agama 22. <coughs> yeah, this is, um, the, the whole chapter that we are studying now is on Venerable Sariputta. And Sariputta is uh, going to exemplify for us the way an Arahant acts and also the problems an Arahant encounters sometimes. So uh, it shows us an arahant in action, making this arahant ideal sketched so beautifully by Bhikkhu Bodhi in theory, making it come alive for us. And here we have uh, Venerable Sariputta as giving a teaching on cessation. Cessation is an attainment which uh, has been much discussed, but probably not as often really attained by meditators. <laughs> because it requires a very high level of skill according to the traditional understanding for you to get into what is called the cessation of feelings and perception, you will have to develop the four absorptions, you will have to develop the four immaterial spheres, and you will also have to develop your insight up to the level of non-return. So it is a very rare kind of experience, but it seems that from ancient times until today, uh, it has nevertheless been calling up much interest and discussion. So Venerable Sariputta is giving a teaching on this, and as we will see, uh, somebody else thinks he knows it better than Sariputta. So I read the discourse for you. <coughs> If a monk is accomplished in virtue, concentration and wisdom, then it is certainly possible that he may, in this life, enter and emerge from the concentration of the cessation of perception and feeling. If he does not attain final knowledge within this life, then with the breaking up of the body at death, he will pass beyond the gods that feed on gross food and be reborn among the mind-made gods. Once he has been reborn there, it is certainly possible that he may enter and emerge from the concentration of the cessation of perception and feeling. So the point uh, that uh, Venerable Sariputta is making here, briefly summarized course, this is a little abstruse topic. So virtue, concentration, wisdom, clear the three main uh, requirements for meditative progress, and somebody gets this high level of this cessation attainment. And he has not become an arahant, she has not become an arahant, so is being reborn in uh, in, in some celestial sphere, and we are told that there he or she uh, may again get into this attainment of cessation. Now here comes another monk. <coughs> I continue reading the discourse. At that time, the Venerable Udayin was also present in the assembly. The Venerable Udayin responded, Venerable Sariputta, if a monk is reborn among the mind-made gods, it is certainly not possible that he may enter and emerge from the concentration of the cessation of perception and feeling. So our Udayan thinks that uh, it's not possible up in that heavenly realm to get this refined type of concentration attainment. Even he or she has had it in the last life. Once up there, not possible. So now it goes in the standard way in the discourses. Uh, when somebody contradicts you, you say it three times. Or if you want something really really strongly, you really say, like, I really want that, you will say it three times. And if after three times you haven't had any success, then you give it up. So here, when Sariputta makes a statement three times, and Udayin for three times says, no, not possible. I continue reading the discourse. Thereupon, the Venerable Sariputta thought, 
This monk has contradicted what I said three times now, and not a single monk in this assembly has commended what I said. Perhaps I ought to approach the Blessed One. That is, he wants to go to see the Buddha. But there the same thing happens. Right in front of the Buddha, Sariputta three times makes a statement. Udai in three times says, no, not possible. And none of the other monks intervenes. Finally, the Buddha takes part. He asks Udai what he means with this statement and shows that Udai was just wrong. He's just misunderstood. And after having directly rebuked Udai, the Blessed One turns on Ananda. Interesting. I read, A most highly regarded and virtuous elder monk has been improperly contradicted. For what reason did you show disrespect by not intervening? You too are a fool with no loving kindness to turn your back on a most highly regarded virtuous elder. Then the Buddha repeats what Sariputta says as a kind of affirmation and goes out. Yeah, I think that uh, this this passage gives us uh, already a feeling for a topic that we have been discussing on the blogs. On the blog, uh, that the question is not to just keep out of things. Now, I would like to mention a small uh, difference between the Madhyama Agma and the Pali version. In the Pali version, uh, the Buddha is not rebuking Ananda in so strong terms. He doesn't call him a fool. And, um, yeah, my personal feeling is that this is probably closer to the truth. I have, this is just a personal feeling. I have the feeling the Madhyama Agama discourse goes a little overboard here with the criticism. You're a fool with no loving kindness to turn your back on a most highly regarded virtuous elder. But in uh, in both discourse, it is very, very clear, just for the fact of keeping quiet, Ananda is being criticized. This is not what the Buddha was expecting his disciples to do. If, uh, if, if there, are, there are situations where one has to intervene, Again, coming back to what I said before, with a calm mind, not with an impassioned mind. Manfred Wiesberger says, So Nibbana is not the inevitable result of emerging from cessation. No, it does not seem so. Nibbana in the sense of, you mean, full awakening, I assume. Yeah. Panyaya chasadisva e kachasava parikina hondi. And having seen with wisdom, some of his taints, influxes, are destroyed by wisdom. So it does not seem that an anagami who one time, a non-returner, forgive me for using the Pali term, a non-returner, by one time getting into the cessation of perception feeling, automatically becomes an arahant. This does not seem to be the case. Thank you for the good question. Yeah, I already said that the uh, Pali version is a little strong. And now, <coughs> uh, Venerable Ananda is now <laughs> a little shaken, obviously. <laughs> he didn't expect to get uh, such a beating. <laughs> so he tells another one, hey, look, when the Buddha, Buddha comes back, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to answer this. So you, you talk to the Buddha in my place, I'm really embarrassed. And so the Buddha comes back and then he takes up this other monk and he says, uh, he asks this other monk, look, what are the qualities because of which one should respect or esteem another monk? And we are, we are getting five, five qualities here and I will read them to you. <coughs> First one. This is the other monk who is replying instead of Ananda to the Buddha about the topic. What are the five qualities that make a monk worthy of respect and esteem? He says, Blessed one, a senior monk observes the training in the precepts, guards against breaking the code of rules, and skillfully controls his comportment in accordance with proper conduct. He trains in the precepts in this way, seeing great danger and even the slightest transgression and being apprehensive of it. So here we get the keeping of the precepts. Second, 
Blessed one, a senior monk studies widely and learns much, retaining it and not forgetting it, accumulating wide learning of what is called the Dharma, which is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, which has proper meaning and expression, is endowed with purity and reveals the holy life. In this way, he studies widely and learns much regarding all the teachings, familiarizing himself with them even a thousand times, mentally considering and contemplating them with knowledge, vision, and profound penetration. So, learning is the second. Again, Blessed One, a senior monk attains the four higher states of mind. These are the four absorptions. Happy abidings in the present. He attains them with ease, without difficulty. So here we have concentration. Again, Blessed One, a senior monk develops comprehension and wisdom, attaining understanding concerning the rise and fall of phenomena, attains no penetrative knowledge and discriminative understanding concerning the true cessation of dukkha. So here we have insight, insight into impermanence and into the nature of dukkha. Again, Blessed One, a senior monk has destroyed all influxes, is freed from all fetters, has attained liberation of the mind and liberation through wisdom in that very life, personally attained understanding and awakening, and dwells having personally realized it. He knows as it really is. Birth is ended, the holy life has been established, what was to be done has been done, there will not be another existence. So the fifth is the eradication of defilements. And in each of these above five cases, the monk says, Blessed one, such a morally restrained, elder and highly regarded monk is esteemed and revered by his companions in the holy life. Blessed one, if a senior monk does not possess these five qualities, there is no other reason that he should be esteemed and revered by his companions in the holy life. Only for his advanced age, hoary hair, lost teeth, deteriorating health, hunched body, unsteady step, overweight body, shortness of breath, reliance on a walking cane, shrinking flesh, sagging skin, wrinkles like pockmarks, failing sense faculties and unsightly complexion, complexion might his companions in the holy life still esteem and rever him. This very plastically describes the effect of old age. So somebody who is old by age just gets the respect for being old, but the real thing that makes somebody worthy of respect and esteem are these five qualities. And Madhyama Agama, both discourses continue with the Buddha clarifying to everyone that Sariputta, he has these five qualities. Ah, no, that is not in the Pali version. Yeah, only in Madhyama Agama. And before I come to, there's a question by Mark, I'll look at that uh, shortly. I just want to present these five qualities to you. <coughs> there's, a, there's a difference here. See? If we look at the Pali version, it has virtuous learned a pleasant voice attains for absorption and has destroyed the influxes. And in the Madhyama Agam we get virtuous learned for absorptions and then has insight into impermanence and has destroyed the influxes. That is one of those points where we have these two versions stand side by side. I personally think that a, a pleasant voice is something that is certainly important. If we think at the situation, we are in an oral society and uh, a, a monk is expected to preach. This is actually something that all the Arahans do. One of their compassionate activities is to teach and preach others. So it is uh, quite important to have a pleasant voice. But I would still think, my, pers my personal feeling, I would rather go for the five qualities in the Madhyama Agama version here. It would, if I would feel more in. I would feel more inspired if somebody has, has penetrative insight. This is implicit in the Pali version, since uh, without insight into impermanence and dukkha, uh, our monk will not be able to destroy the influxes. 
but uh, I, I find it nice that this is mentioned explicitly. And so I just like to summarize the main points that I think come out of the discourse for us, as far as I can see, and you are uh, with my whole heart invited to add and correct me there. And then I come to the comments here in the chat. Yeah, so virtue, concentration and wisdom lead to high meditative attainment. And virtue, concentration, and wisdom are what makes one worthy of esteem and respect in the early Buddhist community. So everybody is invited to add questions now, but I'm first going to deal with the two that are already there. <coughs> Mark says, this exchange of views seems strange to me. Why would the Buddha discourage free exchange of views? Why would putting forward another view be considered rude? Why would Ananda be reprimanded by the Buddha when the Buddha was also sitting there silent as Sariputta's explanation was being contradicted? Um, good point, Mark, but the question is not a discouraging of a free exchange of views. There's a, 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 the, there's a teaching situation and the other monk is, keeps on contradicting and none of the others is taking part in the discussion. That is the problem. So it's it's not in itself the putting forward of another view is rude, but the way Udayan does it is definitely rude. That is that is not the way. I mean, we are not uh, these discourses do not take place in a university class where you can just get up and tell the lecturer, "Hey, that's rubbish. That's completely out." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have the experience in, in Sri Lanka, and I have had the monastic experience. If the teacher says something with which you disagree, there's a, there's a way of going about it that is, uh, that is quite different from what Udayan says. You don't just get up and say, hey, that's wrong. No way. <laughs> so the, the way our friend Udayan has been putting forward his opinion is quite rude. If you read it from the viewpoint of early discourses and how one interprets, it is rude. And uh, Ananda, <coughs> being a close friend of Venema Sariputta and uh, the, 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 the assistant of the Buddha, he would have been the first monk in that situation and to, to also take a position because he was very learned. He was famous for being very learned. And the Buddha was probably keeping silent because he was himself surprised that nobody was saying anything. So he let the situation escalate up to the third repetition, I would say, precisely because he wanted to clarify that this is not proper. The problem of settling would, uh, the, the doctrinal issue could have been done very easily, but the fact that this whole group had to come to his front and still nobody was intervening was apparently seen by him as something that, that was very inappropriate and he wanted to give that teaching. Juliana Martini, she says that this reminds me of the Kinti Sutta in the Devadaha Vaga of the Majjhimanikaya, where the Buddha gives detailed instructions on how to deal with disagreement of opinion with another monk. And, whoops, also how to deal skillfully and compassionately with a misbehaving fellow monk who commits an offense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, another, another very nice uh, discourse that might also come to mind is the Aranavibhanga Sutta, also in the, in the Majjhimanikaya, uh, where uh, we are taught how to frame our statements, how to phrase our statements in such a way that they are not offensive. And, and that, they, that, that, that we, we can... Yeah, this is actually something I still have to learn. <laughs> how to uh, express criticism without hurting others. <laughs> Instead of this uh, very German blunt way that I have, uh, hey, this is wrong. <laughs> There's ways of, uh, and I've been told there in American universities, there are courses where they teach you how to say this is wrong in such a nice and diplomatic way that nobody's getting hurt. Maybe the question is not merely one of diplomacy, but it's very clearly that our Udayan has been phrasing his disagreement, for which basically he is certainly entitled to, in a way that was rude. Okay, there's, I think, still one other question coming. <coughs> Rosa. The thing is that the Buddha puts the emphasis on behavior and mutual respect. That seems to be more important than opinions. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a very nice point, Rosa. Yeah, that's actually something I I, I can very much uh, relate to from my own experience when going to live in Sri Lanka. As a German, I was very much used to seeing myself as an individual that has is marked by the different types of opinions that I have, and I was always ready to any any topic you raise, and I say, I think this. I'm for this party, I'm against this, and I'm against this. And it took some time for me when living in Sri Lanka to learn that human interrelationship in Sri Lanka does not operate in this way. The most important thing is to look for harmony and express respect towards the other and keep one's own opinions at the background. And this has been incredibly helpful for my personal development, for letting go of my ideas and my very firm opinions that I had, seeing them just as something, and for being much more aware of the others. And there's a very uh, beautiful example I just recently had at a conference in Taiwan. Uh, we had a conference, and the topic was very um, exciting for me. I was very interested, so I was really was fully there. And one of my friends, he said something, I just went, No, impossible. What is your basis? What is your, what is, on what are you basing this? And the poor fellow, he got so, <laughs> I mean, I still feel so sorry about it. And then a little later, the same speaker was also getting a reply from somebody else that is uh, Venerable Huimin, the, the head of the whole thing, of the whole uh, school where we were having the course. And he was, he was looking at me saying, maybe another possibility, perhaps. And then he put out his thing. And I thought, last like, hey, my. This is what you got to learn. <laughs> it's so nice and soft, you see. Both of us have been expressing our disagreement, but the way I did it was just plain rude. And it, it was not necessary to be rude. And the way the other person, when Bohemian was doing, was so gentle and so kind, with so much compassion, and, and was just opening up an additional vista instead of this black and white contrast that I was creating between the other one's wrong, I'm right. So there's a lot, there's a lot for us to learn there. Yeah, enough about me. <laughs> I think time to go into the, go for the next discourse now. <clears throat> yeah. The, let me just see, let me just briefly see how much time we have here. Yeah. Could the question at the background of this discourse is related to a Vinaya regulation? <clears throat> Excuse me. There are four rules for monks, eight for nuns, so-called parajika rules. If we break them, we are no longer a monk, no longer a nun. And one of these is about false claim to spiritual attainments. So if I knowing that I am not an arahant, I stand in front of you and say, I am an arahant. If I would be doing that, I would be breaking one of these parajika rules and would lose all my privileges. And I was originally thinking of discussing this a little bit, but I think I will be just very brief on this, because uh, I, I think with the remainder of the time that we have, I'd rather stay with the discourse. So I just briefly mentioned there is a scholar, Shane Clark, uh, in an article published in Indo-Iranian Journal 2009, when and where is a monk no longer a monk? And he argues that uh, Parajika does not result in loss of one's monk and nun status. And I was going to tell you exactly why I think his case is not convincing, but I think I, I dropped that. I'm, I'm anyway publishing a paper on that that hopefully is going to come out some point this year. And so I, I just want you to be aware that this understanding has been challenged by a very learned scholar, but that I disagree with his reasoning. I think uh, there's no reason for us to think that this traditional understanding is not the correct understanding. I think as far as we are able to tell, Somebody who has committed a parajika is no longer able to live as a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni. 
he or she can become a novice and stay on at a monastery. That's not all of, that is certainly the case. But uh, if I were to do what I said before, I would lose all my monk privileges. I would no longer be able to participate with other fully ordained monks in the various things that we do together. And there's no way I could get this back. Yeah, so the situation at the background of this discourse is that a monk has disrobed. His name is Molia Paguna. And there's another monk, Kala Rakatiya, and he tells Sariputta about that. So I read the discourse. <coughs> Excuse me. The monk Kala Rakatiya approached the Venerable Sariputta and said, Venerable Sariputta, know that the monk Molia Paguna has given up the precepts and stopped practicing the path. The Venerable Sariputta asked, Was the monk Molia Paguna happy in the teaching? The monk Kalara Katiya said, asked in return, Is the Venerable Sariputta happy in the teaching? And the Venerable Sariputta replied, Kalara Katiya, I harbor no doubts about the teaching. The monk Kalara Katiya further asked, Venerable Sariputta, how is it in regard to things yet to come? That is the future. The Venerable Sariputta replied, Kalara Katiya, I am also without perplexity in regard to things yet to come. On hearing this, <coughs> Kalara Katiya rose from his seat, approached the Buddha. Having paid homage, he sat down to one side and addressed the Buddha. Blessed one, the Venerable Put Sariputta has just now proclaimed that he has attained final knowledge that he knows as it really is. Birth is ended. <coughs> the holy life has been established. What was to be done has been done. There will be not be another existence. Obviously, he is reformulating what he believes to have been implicit in Sariputta's statement. And we get a little bit the impression that he is trying to create trouble for Sariputta. And that is an interesting point that will continue in this discourse and also in the next one that we see how how an Arahant uh, can be defamed or be put into trouble or others trying to put him or her into trouble. <coughs> so the Buddha <coughs> excuse me <coughs> the Buddha calls Sariputta and Sariputta says, hey, I, I didn't say it in these words, but still the implication of his statement that, uh, let me just repeat it, that he is without perplexity in regard to the future, uh, uh, can be read to mean that he has uh, reached full awakening. So the Buddha now takes another turn. <coughs> he says, the Blessed One asked, Sariputta, if companions in the holy life come and ask you, Venerable Sariputta, Knowing what and seeing what, do you declare having attained knowledge, etc.? Sariputta, on hearing this, how would you answer? So the Buddha is taking a different approach. He's no longer, <coughs> what did you exactly say? But if others think you have reached full awakening, how would you confirm it? He's, he's going a little bit in a round way. And Sariputta is giving the, the reply to this, and this is where it gets interesting for us to see what does it mean to be an Arahant. The Venerable Sariputta replied, Blessed One, on hearing this, I will answer in the following manner. Venerable friends, birth has a cause. This cause for birth has been brought to an end. Knowing that the cause for birth has been brought to an end, I declare having attained final knowledge. <clears throat> so this is one basis for him to, acclaim, to declare, I'm an Arahant. And we get the same question and answer, continues, and it moves through from birth to becoming, clinging, craving, and feeling. And maybe some of you already recognize we are here working through some of the links of dependent arising. Birth, becoming, clinging, craving, feeling. <coughs> and from feeling it goes into the three types of feeling. So when asked again by the Buddha, the Venerable Sariputta replied, 
Blessed one, on hearing this, I will answer in the following manner. Venerable friends, these three kinds of feelings are impermanent by nature, dukkha by nature, of a nature to disintegrate. What is impermanent by nature is dukkha. Seeing this dukkha, there is no more delighting in these three kinds of feeling, no desire for them or grasping at them. <coughs> so the Buddha proves, and then he makes a brief statement. He kind of builds on what Sariputta has said. He said, Sariputta, one could also give a brief summary of what you have just said. And what Sariputta is this brief summary of what you have just said? It is this. Whatever is felt and acted upon is all dukkha. Sariputta, this is a brief summary of what you have just said. And after that we get another question and answer exchange that proceeds then from feeling to liberating insight. Yeah, I... The points that I would like to take up here are two. One is the significance of dukkha. You see, the Pali counterpart, the Chinese says whatever is felt and acted upon. This acted upon is not found in the Pali version. <coughs> Pali is just sabang ve dai tang tang dukkas ming. Whatever is felt is within, within dukkha. The question is, what is the meaning of dukkha? So if we use the traditional translation, suffering, whatever is felt is suffering, we have a problem, I think. There are three types of feeling. How could all three be suffering? And according to Mahanidana Sutta, Diga Nikaya, when you experience one type of feeling, you cannot experience the others at the same time. So at the very moment <coughs> of experiencing a pleasant feeling, it cannot really be suffering. Then the traditional explanation, yes, 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 but it's suffering when it changes. That is uh, true to some extent, but still it does not fully work. And I think this is a very important point that I like to discuss with you and present my understanding, see what you think about it. And I would like to base this <coughs> excuse me, on the Chula Vedala Sutta, that is uh, Majjhima Nikaya, volume 1, page 303 of the of the Pali text edition, and we get a similar statement in Chinese and Tibetan. Okay, it says, pleasant feeling is pleasant when it persists and painful when it changes. Yeah? Painful feeling is painful when it persists and pleasant when it changes. It's quite obvious, no? So if you look at this, I have made it a, a little scheme for you to see. So present time, if we compare feelings in present time, then we have pleasant and that is, that is agreeable. It's nice and painful. That is suffering. And then we can compare the future. And there pleasant is disagreeable or suffering, if you like. But then the painful is agreeable. So the thing is that if we want to really understand how all things can be dukkha, if we use the word suffering, this, this, this does not work for painful feeling. If we say, ah, but when it changes, it becomes suffering. You see a very silly example. I mean, I, I don't eat ice cream, but let me use the ice cream example. So when I'm, when I'm eating ice cream, and I, I'm just about to bite into it, and it falls down on the ground, and it gets dirty, and I can't eat it anymore, then this is really suffering here and now. I was just about to get this pleasant feeling and it changed and, and it's gone. But if because I eat ice cream every day, I get a toothache and then at some point the toothache stops, then that is not suffering. So I think we cannot use the translation suffering in any of these directions. Present, We either have to compare present or we have to compare future. So the whole point I'm making is, and Rosa Grau has already already 
typed it out, the proper translation for Dukkha would be insatisfactory. All feelings are unsatisfactory. Even my present eating of the ice cream is unsatisfactory because it's not going to last. Even the ice cream does not fall down. I managed to get the whole thing down my throat. At some point, it will be over. And if I keep on getting another one and another one, I got a stomach ache. And the ice cream cannot give me lasting satisfaction. And that makes a completely different, different, different perspective. So my advocacy is that dukkha, when it refers to the general characteristic of phenomena, is not a suffering, but unsatisfactory. And I actually prefer, as you have already seen in the translation, I just leave the party term because it leaves it open. Because in some contexts, Dukkha does refer to just physical pain. That is certainly true. Yeah, that was one important point I wanted to make, that impermanence is not necessarily suffering, but impermanence makes all feelings unsatisfactory. And then I want to, yeah, there's two comments here. I briefly stop and, yeah, Dania has problems with the video. Yes, I will be uploading the audio on the internet, but that takes some time to upload, so that will be maybe only tomorrow early morning the plain audio will be there. I have uploaded that also for last lecture. And Rosa Grau? <clears throat> she says, in many dialogues, Dukkha follows immediately from Anicca. I never understood why it was so clear to them that inconstant would mean painful. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's my point. Yeah. In impermanence makes things unsatisfactory but it does not make them necessarily suffering. I think this is very important. And and people keep on, I, I keep on hearing this, uh, this this suffering translation, and I keep on getting this, yes, but pe pleasant feeling is suffering when it changes. And when I say, so what about painful feeling? Then wait, it's kind of, <laughs> but we, 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 you see, if I go back to my, my, my little drawing here, we, we cannot go diagonally. That, that doesn't make sense. If I go diagonally and say, well, painful feeling is suffering in the present and pleasant feeling is suffering in the future, then I can go also the other direction and say everything, there's no suffering, there's nothing, everything is happiness, pleasant feeling is ha pleasant now, painful feeling is pleasant in future. For a proper logical approach, we have to stay in, in one of these categories. We can compare pleasant feelings now and in future, painful feelings now and in future, or we can compare present feelings, painful, pleasant, or future feelings, pleasant, painful. We have to stay within one of these these drawings that I made to to to, to make a, a logical statement. Anyway, enough. <laughs> yeah. So getting away from my ice cream. Oof, actually, I don't like ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then I just wanted to briefly mention on dependent arising. Yeah, there, I have just pinned down for you the 12 links of the standard presentation of dependent arising. Ignorance and then reactions under the influence of ignorance, consciousness, name and form, six senses, contact, feeling. Feeling is the crucial point in this discourse. Craving, clinging, becoming, birth, old age and death. And so we see that Sariputta has been kind of working his way from birth up towards feeling and then pointing out to feeling as the central central place for, for insight. And the Buddha has reconfirmed that the importance of knowing that all feelings are unsatisfactory, are dukkha. It's very, very crucial, crucial insight. Yeah, I do not have much time to go into this 12th link presentation. I just wanted to briefly say that there are different perspectives on that, which is being much discussed. And <clears throat> tradition takes these 12 links to extend over more than one lifetime. So 1 and 2 are in a past life, 3 to 10 are in the present, and 11 to 12 are in the future. 
and they also divide this into cause and effects. So 1 and 2, ignorance and reactions are causes. 8 to 10, craving, clinging and becoming are causes. And the rest are effects. However, besides the three life interpretation, already in the very earliest Abhidharma, this is the Vibhanga of the Theravada canon and the Mahavibhasha, excuse me, preserved for us in Chinese translation, we get an application of all 12 links to every single mind moment. So, from that kind of viewpoint, birth doesn't mean the birth uh, coming out of the mother's womb, which it does mean in certain contexts in the early discourses, indubitably, but it can also be interpreted to mean the birth of a mind moment. So I think it's, it's very important to see that we have uh, evidence for both interpretations, and I personally would very much like to recommend seeing them as both valuable interpretations of this doctrine, and not insisting that only one of them is the right one, uh, with the need then to reject the other one. The whole entire teaching of uh, dependent arising is something so extremely meaningful to us in every present moment of our life, right here and now, from beginning to end. At the same time, uh, the early discourses clearly do accept uh, the theory of rebirth and do speak of uh, uh, someone being reborn. And the one interpretation does not exclude the other. And uh, in the hope that I'm not throwing oil on the fire, there's another publication here that has been giving a very new interpretation. Judovitz in the Journal of the Politics Society 2000, playing with fire, the Pratitya Samuppada from the perspective of Vedic thought. And she says that the 12 link formulation also has an aspect of being a criticism of the Vedic creation myth. And the point, according to her interpretation, is that whereas the Vedic texts describe uh, a, 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 to some degree comparable series of terms as leading to the creation of the cosmos, the Buddhist reinterpretation of this then uh, shows that this link lead to Dukkha. Uh, the interpretation by Jurovic is not being accepted by everyone, but I just would like you to be informed of these different uh, points, different perspectives on this doctrine. But I think the really central thing is the, the, the succinct formulation of uh, specific conditionality, it is called. <coughs> and this is, when this is, that comes to be, with the rising of this, that rises. And then the same in the cessation mode. The basic fact of things being conditioned by certain conditions. And it is precisely this specific principle that I think Venomar Sariputta is, is pointing out with each of his single replies, in that he says, look, I've eradicated the cause for birth. This is why I'm fully awakened. I have eradicated the cause for this. He's, he's pointing to a specific condition for his attainment of arahanship, and for that, he would not need to go through all the links, or to all the twelve links, or the, those he uses, one, two, three, four, five. And just one is enough. It's a very succinct pointment. <coughs> yeah, and so just to conclude the discourse, yeah, after the Buddha has left, uh, Sariputta tells the other monks that as first he was a little hesitant, he didn't know what direction the Buddha wanted to take the discussion with him, but now he felt so confident that he felt like discussing with the Buddha for seven days and nights without break. And our Kalarakatya right away goes to the Buddha and says, Hey, Bhante, you know what he said? <laughs> and the Buddha says, It is indeed so. Sariputta could have discussed this with me for seven days and nights. 
So we still get this feeling that this Kala Rakatiya is not very happy with Sariputta. It's just trying to, to find fault with him. Yeah, but aside from this little bit of tension that we feel there towards Sariputta, I think the main main points uh, that we can gather from this discourse are the potential of insight into feelings. It's a very simple thing. Feelings are impermanent. Therefore, they cannot really give me lasting satisfaction. And the other thing is about arahants, that even arahants can become an object of animosity. And this is a problem that we are going to take up uh, next time again with the next discourse. We again get Asariputta being falsely accused. But now it's exactly time to conclude. Yes, I thank you all very much for listening to me for all the uh, helpful, interesting questions and especially the discussion on the blog, which I really enjoyed. And I hope, again, I've been bringing up some points of interest uh, that will uh, be further discussed on the blog. And I wish you all well, and then I hope to see you uh, next week again.